Hi, I'm Ted Haftegaber, founder and producer of Live Talks Los Angeles. Thanks for joining us. Since we started over a decade ago, we have brought you hundreds of conversations with storytellers, writers, actors, musicians, humorists, chefs, and thought leaders in business and science. You can watch and hear most of these in our YouTube channel and our podcast. For details, visit livetalksla.org. And now, Here's the show you've tuned in to see. My favorite thing to do is to come out to talk about someone else's book and then make it about me. It's just <laughs> it's so much fun. Um, this is a big treat uh, for anybody who's familiar with uh, my work over the years, my, uh, I don't know why you'd laugh at that. That was me being honest and sincere. Um, you're terrible people. Uh, uh, I've devoted my lifetime to finding the, uh, the intersection of smart and silly. And when I was a kid, I would watch Monty Python and I would say, this is so funny. This is so silly, but I also can under, I couldn't identify why, but I knew there was an intelligence behind it. And that's one of my favorite things. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, my son, uh, who's here tonight, discovered XKCD and um, just loved it, and then showed, started to show me the comic, and we bonded over it. And I was so happy that my son, uh, A, was so interested in science and in being smart, but also clearly had such a great sense of humor and loved that. So it's a real honor uh, anytime I get to intersect in any way with you, Randall, Aww. because um, I think what you're doing is very hard to pull off. It's really hard. Uh, some people are smart and serious. Some people are silly and stupid. Hello. Uh, and then there's smart and silly coming together, and uh, it's my favorite thing. And you do it beautifully, and What If was fantastic. What If 2 is just as good. If not, it's, it's, it's great. So thank you for being here. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. And I'm, I was always so happy to see uh, that your son was excited. Um, I, I really wasn't expecting when I started doing this that, um, that kids would read it. Like, and, and it, it, I mean, it, it, it was funny because I, I was writing, you know, I'm researching these questions and I was thinking like, oh, I found out this cool fact. I want to like go back in time and give myself the, the, the short version of it, you know, the Cliff's Notes of like, here are all the cool things I learned while I was researching this. Um, and it would often be these really simple questions. And it, it somehow never occurred to me that kids also have questions. And then in fact, many of the questions I was have asking- Have you been around a lot of kids? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I've since realized, well, that's what's great is with this book is people whose kids read the first books, they're now coming to me every time their kids are like, well, why does this work this way? Why is the sky blue? You know, why is someone? And now they're just emailing all those questions to me. <laughs> I remember very clearly when our daughter, who's older than my son, when she was our first, when she was born, uh, when she was about three, I went in just to s tell her a fun little story that a dad would tell a daughter at night in her crib and uh, three, maybe three and a half, and I told her the story and then I turned off the light and she said, Daddy, uh, I have a question. And, uh, and I said, what is it? And she said, who lit the sun and when will the days end? <laughs> and I walked backwards quietly out of the room and shut the door and said to my wife, Liza, your daughter wants you, she has a question. <laughs> I mean, and, and so, so again, not, you know, not being familiar with kids as much, does telling them gravity and five billion years from now, like, 
help? <laughs> or, or is that not a satisfying Well, answer? if I had said that, and you should know this, that if you say that to a child who's maybe five or six, mm -hmm. it's the equivalent of giving them uh, nine lattes uh, <laughs> with extra shots of caffeine. They'll be up all night. It's like ending a story by saying, and the killer was never found. <laughs> and, Good night, and shutting. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, there's a journey here because you, you know, I was fascinated whenever I come across someone like yourself, who I'm a big fan of. I wonder how did this start? And I've read a little bit about you, and you've talked about how your mom, you know, sort of helped feed your interest when you were young in math, maps, how things relate to each other. Is that is that the case? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, she's where I get a lot of my like pattern and um, I guess you know math orientation. And in in kind of like everyday ways, I remember I have this very vivid memory that I eventually wrote a comic about that was one of those ones. This is like this is just a straight true story about my life, um, which was that at one point when I was um, five years old. She let me have a snack in bed, which was otherwise against the rules, you know, but it was like a bowl of cereal or something, and I got to eat it in bed. And, and I really, and I was so excited because that never, you know, I, that, that was like a special treat. And then I wanted it again, and she said, no, that was a one time thing, you know. Um, and I was like, but remember, the other t there was another time you let me have a snack in bed. And she was like, yes, that was when you were sick. And that was when you were two. <laughs> but you know, I'm five, I guess I could remember two at five. I don't know exactly how that mm -hmm. works. But she was like, okay. And I was like, yeah, so see, sometimes I can have a snack in bed and I want one tonight. And she said, no, well, you had one when you were two and you, can ha and you had a snack today and you're five. So you can have another one when you're eight. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, when your age is one less than a multiple of three. Right, um, right. And, and somehow I was like, oh, okay, you know? <laughs> and then like, I reminded her of it like every couple of weeks. It'd be like, oh, I'm, I'm gonna get a snack in uh, you know, two more years in bed. That's, and, that's a really sweet story. That's not how it would have gone down with my son. If I had used the same logic, he'd have said, no, let me tell you how this is going down. <laughs> um, I mean, but also, I, that was when I, uh, that was not when I learned, that's when my parents learned the danger of telling a kid a specific, a thing will happen at a specific time in the future that you think is a throwaway thing that the kid will not remember. Because similarly, when I was five years old, uh, I remember my dad had given me stories from like, you know, Boy Scouts and, and the kid, the people in it had whittling knives. And I was like, when can I have a knife? And my dad was a machinist and was like, you know, knew about safety, but did not know about ages. <laughs> and was like, and I was, this was when I was five, and I remember asking, and asking, and he said, uh, you can have a knife when you're nine, because that seemed impossibly far in the future. And then every week from then on, I was like, I get my knife in three years. <laughs> and he was like, oh no. Yeah. Um, the, uh, so did you get the knife at nine? I did, I, with like very, no, I, I mean, that was part of, part of like, you know, Why my Why are you a pro knife crowd? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it, it's um, disturbing. That, that's, I got a lot of my, my kind of, you know, more practical engineering background from, you know, we had like a machine shop in the basement and my, and my dad was very, very strict about safety about that kind of stuff. So like, I got a knife and I got very clear, you know, here's how to use this safely, here's how you cut with it, you know, here's, here's what to be careful. It was like one of those tiny pen knives, but I was very excited. Um, the, um, you know, I, I, what I love is your philosophy uh, behind, I don't know if it's just, if it's XKCD or more specifically just the books, um, the how to and what if books. The, my question is, you have this great way of telling people it's okay to be confused, and in fact, it's the natural state of things to be confused. And I think that's an important thing for everyone to hear, because I know in my life, when I meet someone who says, the answer's simple, and I know exactly what to do, 
I'm very suspicious of that person's intelligence. When someone says, I really don't know, and this is worth thinking about, I respect them. And I think that is a philosophy that you take in these books is, you're right to ask these questions, let's take a look. And no question is too silly. Yeah, yeah, the, I, I really like to divide questions not into like silly questions and serious questions, but into like questions that have an answer and questions that don't. And then whether it's silly, you know, whether it's worth applying these tools to them to get the answer is, you know, sort of up to you. Um, and up depends on what kind of problems you are dealing with, uh, what you're trying to do. But like showing people that like these tools can get you answers, um, even if the questions are silly, is is something I really you know try to get across. But being confused, definitely like you know in my time in academia, but also just spending time around a lot of people from like a scientific or academic background. There's just a huge amount of pressure on you to n never reveal that you don't understand something. Whether it's like because you're trying to show that you belong in the group or because you've like staked your career on like, I have expertise on this thing. You know, I'm the person you can go to with questions about, you know, like uh, hydrology or volcanoes or, you know, uh, uh, hair styling, I don't know. The, like whatever it is, you're like I'm the I'm the person with the answers on this, and then then you're like, well I'm really undercutting myself if I say I don't know anything, you know the answers to the thing you know that you're asking, um, and that's, I think that's just part of life is like feeling that insecurity, but definitely like the way, academia works, and then the way we respond to that, can make that a lot worse, um, and because the truth is like, scientists are confused by stuff all the time and. And I'm definitely confused by stuff all the time. Um, and, and so I like showing people like, here's a question no one has ever tackled before. I definitely don't know the answer to this. This is not something I learned in school. You know, the, like what happens when you fill the solar system with soup is not, so I- I don't can, know what was wrong with your school. We tackled yeah, that all well, the so time. I, 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 I did it. Brookline I did just, High School. Uh, yeah, I did an undergraduate degree. <laughs> and so I feel like that's probably, there's a graduate soup physics class. Um, which. What but, I love is you, ta you tackle that question about filling uh, in and, and what uh, the solar system or the atmosphere of a soup. And which came from a five year old, which I'm starting, is it actually just five year olds specifically who are the problem? Like, <laughs> I wouldn't say there's a problem. Uh, <laughs> But, um, but yeah, I love that you start to get into it. And what's nice is this technique you have of the question is absurd or seems absurd. And then you start to say, let's use the tools that we have in science and tackle this. And then you proceed to do it. And that to me is the wonder of it all. And then you even get to the point in that section of the book where you start talking about what kinds of soup would react differently are there noodles in the soup? Are there pieces of chicken? How do they interface? And again, you stick with, in, in pure comedy, you'd say you're sticking with the premise and you're riding it all the way, but here you're sticking with the science and you're saying, well, we must consider gazpachos. We must, <laughs> you know, well, there are various broths. Uh, what, what do we think of those? Yeah, and also like sticking with the science, both like takes, you, you go into some funny directions just in terms of like, it's fun to imagine what would happen if the moon crashed into, Almost anything, really. Um, <laughs> but, but, but also, science is full of weird and funny stuff. Like, right. and, and like the, with the black holes, like if the soup, you know, the, the, so if you fill the solar system with soup, spoiler alert, uh, the event horizon will enclose the soup, which means it is a black hole and it will collapse into a singularity. Right. Um, but there's this big debate in physics about uh, whether black holes retain information about the thing that they have uh, eaten. You know, like whether when they, when they collapse together, do they have any properties beyond just their mass and their uh, electric charge and their rotation rate? You know, they're like, just a couple of properties. Um, and you know, like if you put one kind of thing into a black hole or another kind of thing in, or if it's spinning or if it's charge or if it's matter or any matter, how much does that change the black hole? And the theory is that they do not. Um, and this is, this is the, the no hair theorem because it's like black holes have no hair, they're featureless. And I don't know why we settled on that name, um, but I like, I like that it does simplify the soup question because no matter what kind of soup 
we're starting with here, according to the theorem, um, it just becomes a uniform black hole soup no matter what ingredients you put in. And then, and then also if someone complains that there's a hair in their soup, you can be like, there is not. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, what I love is there are some of the questions, I was flipping through the book, and you know, a lot of these are from kids. I don't know if they're all from kids, but a lot of them are from kids. But there are questions that are disturbing. Uh, there was one I came across, which was, uh, what's the best way to dispose of a body using various solvents? And you, you, it's great, you don't get into it too much because you don't want to be helping this person who may be up to no good. Yeah, well, I mean, there was one that was, um, where someone was really saying, what if I jumped into a container of liquid nitrogen and sank to the bottom? Um, would I shatter when I hit? Or, and also, if I have, but the way, I think the way she wrote it was like, what if I jumped into a container of liquid nitrogen or were disposing of a body there? <laughs> and I think that pushed it over the line into, I, I put that in the weird and worrying questions category. Um, when did you worry that there were a lot of criminals posing as children? I've, My name's Timmy and I'm five. <laughs> if one were to have a severed head and an ATM card but you didn't know the pin number, <laughs> I, they're using you, man. I get a surprising number of questions about like, I hear Air Force One has a lot of defenses. <laughs> but what about, and I'm like. Hey, you got my letter. Uh, I'm yeah. like, this is one, there are questions you'll joke about like, you know, the FBI will show up at my door. That one, it really could happen. Um, they have a whole department that's just investigating people talking about that. Like, I'm like, I am not going to answer this question like. Uh, on the advice of my, my counsel. Uh, I do, what I, there, there are a few questions though that, like I have the weird, you know, these questions for, these sections for weird and worrying questions, but then there are the ones where, um, where honestly these, there are some questions that I do answer that are, if anything, more worrying. And I think, I think the middle school chemistry classes are where the, the most alarming questions come yeah, from. Yeah, I, I noticed yeah. that, yeah. Yeah, the, the one about, there was the one that was like filling your, what if you just kept pumping ammonia with a, into your stomach with a tube? <laughs> and I was like, okay, this is very alarming, do not do that, like, but also, I mean, I don't actually know what would happen. <laughs> And once they ask, I'm curious. And so I got to like get in touch with a chemist and learn, man, nothing will like convince you that that's a bad idea than listening to a chemist who knows what it will do, tell you in very clear and dry terms. So what happens? Because I learned- I had an hour free tonight and I was thinking about it. I learned the word saponification, which is conversion of organic material into soap, which is what happens to the walls of your stomach. Um, there's also ulceration of the gastric lining. I actually, this is a place where I was like, I'm not even gonna describe what's gonna happen. I'm just going to list phrases from the material safety data sheet first aid like guide to like case studies of people who have encountered this substance. Here's a list of phrases from that. And it's like saponification, perforation of the, oh, perforation of the viscera. They use the word viscera. It's, that's vivid. Um, the, you know, thermal burns throughout the gastric lining, like, you get a, a lot of, um, and then like, also complaints of pain. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna listen, I would love to hear now, you know, they're ubiquitous, they're everywhere, the, uh, the ads for different medications. And yeah. they always end with, may cause saponification. I just yeah. wanna listen to, they may be sneaking words in there that yeah. basically mean the walls of your cells may turn into soap. Yeah, yeah. I, um, the, and, and what's always fun is when you stumble on a, on a thing where you're like, what happens if you expose, you know, if, what happens if you encounter this chemical combining with this chemical and you learn like, we have, there is one person with firsthand experience of this. <laughs> and like, either they're able to tell you what happened or they're not. And either, either way, like the fact that there's only one person who's experienced it is already like a real warning sign. Right. There's a, couple of, there's a couple of radiation accidents where there's like only a couple of people who have experienced firsthand what that's like and we just have to like do interviews with the people who were in the room when it happened but not close enough, but like far enough away that they had a chance to describe what happened. It's, you and I were talking yeah. about this backstage <laughs> about not 10 minutes ago that why is it that uh, you know, when superheroes are exposed to gamma radiation or any kind of radiation, 
they become the most admired, cool people in the universe with amazing powers, when in reality you just vomit a lot and die, you know? <laughs> There's no yeah. league of guys who vomit a lot and die. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, so, so it, it always feels like a downer um, to be like, uh, uh, no, actually, like, whether or not it's a radioactive spider that bites you or a genetic, genetically engineered spider that bites you, like, there's no good, there's no good kind of spider bite. <laughs> um, and like, there's no, you know, the, the, when radiation was new and they're like, oh, well, we expose people to radiation, that'll surely, you know, it changes them in all kinds of ways. And it's like, well, it changes their cells' ideas of what they want to become, but, but they do not do it in an organized fashion and it's very bad, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and and like like there are no good consequences of this. Right. And and I feel it feels like a huge downer when people are like, look, science, you know, is going to unlock these superpowers, and we're like, no, no, it can't. And I always like to follow that up with like, you know, no, this thing can't happen. You know, like no, there are no dragons, but there are animals that are weirder than you know what you're imagining and cooler and like, you know, they do, do all these things that are like so far beyond our imagination. A dragon is just a big lizard, you know? Right. But, but actual animals are so much weirder and so much, and, and, and you know, you can like replace that with something, be like, here's a cool real thing from science. That you can actually go see. Yeah. You can, you can experience. Yeah. I feel like that works less well with some of the superhero stuff because like the wondrous cool explanation I replace it with is like, no, it won't give you superpowers. Um, it, but it also doesn't always make you throw up and die. Sometimes <laughs> it makes you have other symptoms. <laughs> <laughs> this is why your Marvel pitches never go well. No. <laughs> Speaking of really cool animals, here's a question that you uh, take on in the book. If a T-Rex were released in New York City, how many humans uh, a day would it need to consume to get its needed cal calorie intake? Um, and you actually work out the answer. How do we know what the caloric intake of a T-Rex was? Um, we don't, but this is like, so sometimes I'll have a question where I'm like, I found one paper or one data source, but like dinosaur metabolism is like a big central question in paleontology. I know like when I was a kid, all the dinosaur books I read were like, the big debate of it would be like, were they warm-blooded or cold-blooded? You know, were they big, slow lizards or were they fast, like mammals and like active and did they thermoregulate? Um, and then because I had a lot of like used books and old, um, they would all be like, and also why did they all die out? Someday someone may figure out an answer, but you know, no one has any idea. Uh, it's been a mystery for the 30 years since we first discovered these creatures. And then I'd be like, where? Wait, how old is this book? <laughs> um, but um, yes, oh, I actually I have a great dinosaur book that is from after we had developed like a lot of good paleontological theory, but before we had figured out continental drift. <laughs> and so they're like, yes, it seems like the dinosaurs moved freely between uh, Africa and, uh, and, and South America, for example, because we can see the plant species are you know, similar on both sides. Here's a map showing how the land bridges that used to exist before they were destroyed by, by volcanoes must have looked, you know? Um, so that's always fun. But no, so, so, so I get, but, but there was a big debate, are they warm-blooded or cold-blooded? And the answer is, if they're either, it's warm-blooded. Um, but they're not really the same as, as um, either. They're not lizards, they're not mammals, they are, uh, birds are dinosaurs, so they're more like birds than any of those. Um, but they're big and you know, weigh th uh, uh, you know, dozens of tons, hundreds of tons, or some of them you know, 40 tons, 50 tons. So, so they're not like birds either. Um, but they are, so they're, they are less active than mammals. And there are all these studies that we're looking at, like, for a given, you know, body weight, what's the caloric intake going to be? What's the, you know, metabolism going to be? From that, you can back out calories and figure out, like, a T-Rex would have eaten about so many calories. The harder thing to look up is, if you eat a human, <laughs> how many calories is that? Yeah, and then, you know, that's on your computer forever. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so, Trust me, you know. so I did find, I actually, I got to blame another cartoonist, uh, uh, my friend Ryan North of Dinosaur Comics, who went and did this calculation, and then I just got to cite him, so then when people are like, why did you look that up? And I was like, oh no, I just found it, Ryan had it. And they'll be like, why did Ryan ha have it? And I'll be like, 
That's a good question, you know. <laughs> I've been wondering that. I'm too. worried about yeah. Ryan. You should go talk to him. Yeah. Well, your answer in the book, should I give it away or I, I don't know? Um, if... Yeah, yeah. No, spoil, spoil away. Yeah, because... about half of an adult or one 10 year old child. Yeah. <laughs> The thing, this is assuming... So you're I, like, you're wasting food if you go after the adult, right? Unless or, you're going to come back later or, and you have Tupperware, you know, you know? Or if this is a daily caloric intake, you're, um, you know, maybe they just don't need to eat for another... That's, that covers them for the next two days. Um, but also, I don't know, like, w what parts of humans are appetizing to a T-Rex. Um, this is another of those things. The one guy who, who found that out, <laughs> we, don't, we only have one, one piece of data from him because he got eaten. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, <clears throat> um, no, the, the, yeah, the material safety data sheet for a T-Rex, that's got to be, have some fun language on it about how do you safely handle it. Um, no, the, the um, so I don't know, but it did, for me, put that one Jurassic Park scene into a new light, mm -hmm. you know, where the, like, the guy, the, the T-Rex breaks out of the, the thing and stomps between the cars and then eats the lawyer. Yep. Um, As one should. Yeah. Well, what, what, was, what was striking about that is like, Scientifically, all seems like realistic up until there, um, and like no complaints. Uh, uh, dinosaurs are very big and hungry, and and I certainly will believe they'll eat people. But then reading, doing this caloric calculation, it's like, well, the T-Rex would have been full at that point. <laughs> you know, not chasing. A Why is Jeep? it then go and has, going and hassling a, a Grant and Sattler and the and the kids by the? Yeah. You know, and and and. My so problem, maybe, I was out of the movie yeah. once I saw that Jeff Goldblum was wearing leather in the tropics. I just, <laughs> that's like five minutes yeah, in. Yeah, I was yeah. like, no, I'm out. Uh, I mean, chaotician. <laughs> <laughs> you ask a question uh, that's near and dear to my heart because people have teased me about my lack of melanin my entire <laughs> life and my paleness uh, and making SPF jokes, and you have a question in here, what SPF would you need for a one-hour trip to the surface of the sun? <laughs> and you figure that out. Yeah, I mean, uh, how, you know, how, how pale and sun senses are, are we talking? Do we need a Conan correction? Like where You we probably are? do. <laughs> I'm bringing it up because it's something that's eating away with me. The answer you come up with probably needs to be adjusted if I'm going. Yeah, no, because it's, it's totally... Yeah, I'm the, the guy in the, in the drugstore yelling if they only have 50. If they have SPF 50, I'm irate that they're threatening my life I mean, with not a so, high enough number. So this, this happened with the, uh, um, with the Apollo astronauts, even just going up to space. Uh, the you know, Weather Service will publish like UV index, which is like how much UV radiation is getting to the surface where you are based on you know, uh, sunlight, sun altitude, ozone factors, et cetera. Um, that's like, here's the risk of sunburn. And you can calculate a UV index for space. Um, like just above the Earth's atmosphere, we have no protection from the ozone layer or anything. And it's, it's, it's pretty high. Um, and this, this actually did, there is a story, at least, um, that uh, one of the uh, Apollo astronauts, uh, I, I think it might have been Gene Cernan, but had a triangular patch on a, their space suit that like, one of the protective layers had gotten torn away, and it wasn't one of those like sealed, you know, uh, uh, pressure things. But it was doing a lot of the heavy work of, of SPF, you know, of radiation protection. Uh -huh. And that he had a triangular sunburn on his back from just like spacewalks, right? Um, or from uh, yeah, from from being in space. Um, I forget. It wouldn't have been the Apollo. Well, so the the, the definitely with the Apollo astronauts, the. Um, it was not the most diverse crowd, uh, <laughs> but um, so definitely some sunscreen requirements there. Yes, um, but the the but it, it, th this is a real problem that they're facing with, like because the radiation exposure up there is is serious, and they and. And it's, and it's a problem down here because like when I was reading this, I was looking into like, okay, how does sunscreen protect you? How, um, uh, how like when they say this, you know, SPF 50 means it, you, if you would get sunburn in, in three minutes, now you'll get sunburn in three times 50 is, you know, 150 minutes. And I, I've always been like, does it matter how I smear it though? Like, 
Because like sometimes I feel like I put on a little bit, but you can't see it. I don't know how much it's protecting me. And it turns out the answer is like, it's ve they're very fast and loose about that. Like the testing circumstances are much more like there is a uniform film of this thickness over all the skin. Um, and, and there are a couple of studies of this showing that like in real, um, in real life application, it's not anything like that. And so, so I have not been outside since 1998. I <laughs> totally paranoid about this. I think you're yeah. absolutely right. Well, the thing that got me, I was thinking is like, if you really could just add SPF, like if you have, you know, SPF 20 and you put on a layer of that, that should reduce the UV coming through by a factor of 20, which means if you put another layer of SPF 20 on top of that, it should reduce it by another factor of 20. So you should be getting SPF 400. <laughs> At so, what point are you emitting light? <laughs> yeah. That's what I want. I just want to be like a golden god that's emitting you could just people. get, yeah, I mean, you could get one of those mylar blankets where not only will you be like absorbing the UV, but you'll be reflecting it back at other people. And so like, people will get more sunburned by standing near you. That's, That's what I want, yeah. yeah. You talk about, uh, there's a part of the book, a chapter about uh, Old Faithful and geysers. And it was a question that someone wrote in, which is something that has occurred to me, like if, if I was on some kind of disc or something and I could, and it was just as a geyser was about to go like Old Faithful in, mm -hmm. in yellow, would, would I, how high would I go? How fast would I go? And you get into it and then you find out all this interesting stuff about geysers and accidents that have happened with geysers. Yeah, um, I like this question because it, it, it was interesting from um, both like a theory and a, and a and a data history point of view. Um, from a theory point of view, it made me realize that like, this was like the, the thing where it's like, I, I assumed I knew about this, but then when someone actually asks, I don't know what the stuff coming out of a geyser is. <laughs> like, I, kn I know it's water, but I don't know if it's like steam or is it actually like a jet of water that's just kind of turning to mist or, and is it, I assumed it was hot because I know it's geothermally powered, but like, is it, um, is the water actually coming up out of the top hot, or is that just like there's pressure down below because of heat? Um, and, and short answers to those, uh, it's, it is a, a mix of steam that's condensing of, of super high pressure, uh, more steam than water, but it's pretty dense and it's condensing as it comes out. It is very hot and you would be burned very badly if you stood over Old Faithful uh, and, and let it erupt. Um, but if you did have some kind of a protected disc or something, it does totally have the momentum to lift you into the air. But wouldn't it, with such force, I feel like my legs would uh, be shattered by Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> you just encouraged me to get the disc. I did. And said I'd be I, safe. That's how I read it. That's how I heard you, and I have witnesses here. You said, yeah, with the disc. So my no, people were out buying was, a disc. I said it would launch you into the air. Now... What's your plan after that? <laughs> Radical leg surgery? <laughs> so you're gonna like extend your legs so that they reach the ground from... Exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, yeah. so yes, there's no, no surviving this because yeah, the well, force it's like, with which you go up. It's, and, and it's like, it's not like you don't, you, it, it's not a dramatic thing that's the risk there. It's, it would launch you way up into the air and then if you're a human way up in the air, like the problems you suffer from are like very well understood. <laughs> Um, but as, 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 as told to us by Professor Wiley Coyote, yeah. <laughs> well, but, but no, one, no one has so far died, as far as I know, according to the, you know, the park historians, uh, has died from Old Faithful erupting. There is a ton of deadly stuff around there, and there have been quite a few like, tragic accidents like, around it in the park. There's a lot of like, boiling pools of water. It's really, um, I, I finished, I, I went and looked this up and found it really impressed on me the importance of staying on the walkway when they have signs that are like, don't go off this walkway. And it's one of those things like, the reason that they say that is that people have gone off that walkway and just like immediately plunged into boiling water. Like, well, because the, the, yeah. the surface that's over the, some of these pools is like a thin, very thin crust. Yeah. And it sounds horrible, but people, it's cracked and people have fallen through. Yeah, it's sort of a creme brulee situation. <laughs> yeah. Um, a creme but, brulee that will kill you. Yeah. But it's, um, so as far as I know, no one has, at least no one has like made it to Old Faithful alive and then died. Um, but, 
a huge number of people have been really badly burned you in the vicinity. Be, you should be a tour guide for the park. <laughs> Well, this way, your chances of dying, well, actually, a lot of people could, well, actually. <laughs> well, the thing, that they, the thing that they did get burned from, you know, and it's, yeah. is they wanted to look in and see where the steam was coming from. <laughs> right. It's like, it's not a good reason. It's like, right. like, the thing that you're like, well, you know, I assume I shouldn't go and lean over and look that. And like, if you assume that, you're already ahead of a number of, uh, a, a, one particular German doctor who visited in the 1920s, um, the, at least one person did fall into the little crevice while trying to peer into it, and then it started erupting and had to be like, claw, you know, claw. Oh, he got out. Yeah, he did get out. Um, there have been some burns there, but, but uh, they've managed to be strict enough about the rules that that stopped happening quite so often. The early 20s were a free, freewheeling time in terms of uh, safety. Yes. <laughs> People were driving around wearing raccoon coats and Scuds bear cats. And yeah, yeah. Drinking gin out of hip flasks and yeah. staring into geysers, waiting for them to erupt. <laughs> That's what the and then the Great Depression, no, uh, of course, yes, led directly Think, from that. Things got much safer after that. <laughs> um, I love talking to you because there are so many parts of the conversation that would I would never happen with anybody else I'm talking to, which makes me very happy. Um, there's a chapter. This I really loved. How many people would it take to build Rome in a day? Because there's old saying, Rome wasn't built in a day, and you really go after this. And uh, basically, you come to the conclusion that no, there's, there's no way, e even with an infinite resources and an infinite number of people, but the way you get there in this chapter is so much fun. Um, and I just was reading it as, as someone who's hired contractors to do something. <laughs> I was like, I don't care how many there are, you're gonna, no, it's not gonna happen. Yeah, I, I was, it was interesting that like, so first of all, like you can't, you can't gather, you know, all the world's population together into one city, this, you know, space the size of Rome to work on a project um, to, if you are curious why, uh, you can check out the first What If, which has a chapter on this. Uh, it was, what if everyone gathered in one place and jumped? And, and the answer is like nothing interesting seismically would happen, but you would have all of the world's population in one place and getting them back out is a logistical nightmare and it turns out uh, most of them right. would not survive. We don't have the transport capacity and the food supplies. Um, but with this, an interesting, the question, you know, so, so, so we've, I sort of know what would happen if you tried to get everyone in one place to build Rome, which is like, the person building aqueducts and the person who's like getting the lions for the Colosseum and like they'd all be like running into each other um, and and you'd have so you'd have aqueducts everywhere with lions like eating people and you know you just have like logistical chaos like building one house is is enough but what I got in I was wondering is like first of all like just the basic question building Rome mm -hmm. I mean you can't build Rome in a day because Rome is already there but, and they would get mad if you tried to build another one on, on top of it. Like you could build a city like here, but then it would be LA, you know? It would just be like, oh, this is an LA with more lions and aqueducts. Uh, but, but um, you know, if you wanted to build, if you wanted to like assess what would it, what work, what's, you know, what's the like person hours to build a city like Rome, to build a replica of Rome? Mm -hmm. Um, and so I was like, okay, I'm gonna try a bunch of like really bad ways of estimating this. And none of them are in themselves trustworthy, but like if they all kind of point to the same order of magnitude of like effort, then maybe that's like a good first guess. Um, and, and this is an approach, um, there's a, a, a statistician, uh, John Tukey, I think, who had a quote that, oh man, I. That, that is not that a one, does that not doesn't get applause often. a lot, but when it does, I'm like, yeah, there is there is a person who I would probably be friends with. Um, yeah. but no, it's Any John um, Tukey fans in the house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the, the, and the quote, and and I love this. It's it's something. It's a uh, uh, something like better and a and a better an approximate answer to the right question than an answer to the wrong question, which can be than an exact answer to the wrong question, which can be made infinitely precise. You know, like, you, and, and, and I like this because it's like, it's not, I like keeping in mind uncertainty and keeping in mind, um, you know, like, we've got an answer here, but it's a number. Is it right? How sure are we? 
you know, if this is just for a, the purpose of a fun comparison, uh, then maybe this, this error bar is good enough. It's okay if it's off by 50%. If we have a T-Rex and we're trying to feed it, <laughs> we're gonna need to nail this number down more. Right. We need to call Ryan North and be like, hey, the, the person that you used for this uh, caloric stat, was it a lawyer? Was it a, you know? <laughs> um, but so with, with the Rome one, I, I, I had a friend who was in the middle of re re renovating a house, and I was like, hey, you, you tile, they were dealing with tiling a bathroom. And I was like, can you tell me how much the people, the contractors charged per like hour and per square foot? And they were like, yeah, it was about, took this many hours to do a square, you know, per square foot, this many dollars. And I was like, okay, cool. And then I just took that rate and took the area of Rome. <laughs> And multiplied them and got like, all right, it's this rate, this many person hours of work. But then I was like, okay, room is not a tile floor. <laughs> and I'm a, I'm, I, I have a physics background, so we love just approximating everything as like the most absurdly simple abstractions. But I do appreciate that there are things in room other than white tile with grout between them, you know. Um, I haven't been there, but I've seen pictures. <laughs> and, and so I was like, Rome is... You know, it's, uh -huh. it's this landmark, it's been there, you know, for, for millennia, it's full of priceless, like, cultural heritage treasures, you know, uh, uh, artistic treasures that you can't put a price on. The, 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 so I was like, okay, the roof of the Sistine Chapel, like, so how long did it take Michelangelo per square meter, <laughs> you know? Right. And like, what would the rate be if you covered, if you just hired more Michelangelos? to do the Sistine Chapel, but it's Because they're in the yellow pages Rome. under Michelangelo. Yeah. <laughs> You've got, you know, Michael, Michelangelo, Michael Angel, you know, <laughs> Michelle Angelo, and you're like, uh -huh. okay, all of you, on average, you're probably good painters, you know. Um, so then you've got the actual Michelangelo doing like, like his swatch of the Sistine Chapel, and then next to it you've got like the, the, the part that has been filled in by someone else who happens to have a similar name. <laughs> Um, and I, you get, but I was like, okay, but if you just assume all of Italy is a, is a Sistine Chapel, like all of Rome is a Sistine Chapel quality work of art, and like it's going to take this much effort and this much you know, time, it's like in big picture thinking, not the estimate you come up with for like the cost and the time and the number of people, it's not that different, you know. Um, it's... It's, it's really more like if you're gonna have a person put a bunch of time into an area. Like the, the Sistine Chapel one takes more time, but it still gives you a sense of like, is this doable with this many person hours, like what we have available? Like if we have eight billion people on earth, would eight billion you know, people times 24 hours of work be enough to do all of this work? And it turns out whichever approximation you use, the answer is probably yes just in terms of the, the person hours that you'd apply to build. So I looked at also big construction projects, you know, like you have, you're gonna build a conference center and you can estimate like by the, how much time it will take and how many person hours based on like the price and the square footage and the stuff. And you, you plug those estimates in and then just put in the size of Rome. And you also come up with like a different number, but still in the same range, still like doable with about, um, you know, 8 billion people times 24 hours. So like, I would, use, I would use Olive Gardens because they're, <laughs> it's there's the a lot of them and it's the closest yeah. approximation we have uh, in the rest of the world to Rome. <laughs> we know how long it takes to build an Olive Garden. So we figure out if it's that many Olive Gardens and some are stacked and some are next to each other. Am I, am I anywhere, am I helping at all? Here, here's the problem. I would answer you. Mm -hmm. But I am derailed by one specific thing you said right there, which is, we know how much time it takes to build an olive garden. <laughs> because I do not. <laughs> and it's if a I good were, thing I'm here. <laughs> takes nine were, months to build an olive garden from scratch. Is, is that a gestation period? <laughs> it closely resembles yeah. the human gestation period. <laughs> When they, when they tell you, you're, you're, you know, your young one is now the size of a grape, you know, now the size of a fruit, they always use when, fruit. Just that, before birth, yeah. they say, you have an olive garden. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the, yeah, the, like, where would you even go to figure out how long it takes to build an olive garden? I would um, go to where they're making an olive garden. <laughs> where is that? 
Well, they're building them all the time. They're, it's a plague. I they're seen everywhere. One. Yeah, I know, but I haven't actually seen one under construction. Well, I think you easy to look up in construction records. This all Where are construction records? So I'm asking this because I have tried. <laughs> so, so You've tried for the, what? For the McDonald's question. Uh -huh. So, like, so like I, actually, I actually have a list I've been keeping of questions that are impossible to Google for weird reasons. <laughs> um, one of them is like, what are the common Greek synonyms for learn? And the reason is, any sentence you type in with learn and Greek in it gets you how to learn common Greek words. Right. And it's because it's so SEO optimized, you know, like people who are like Duo, Duolingo or whoever. The question, so there was, I walked into a hotel at one point and then I had just turned on news alerts on my phone and I got a news alert that was like, the architect who's the inventor of the modern atrium has just died. Um, you know, at, at 96, and it's like an important architecture figure who I did not know about. And I was like, oh, cool, because I was just standing under the largest atrium I'd ever seen. And I was like, that's a funny coincidence. Um, you know, I hadn't been under an atrium in years. And then I walked to the first one, got to notice the atrium guy died. I didn't know there was an atrium guy. Yeah. So I'm His like... His name was Jack Atrium. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I was like, is this his work? You know... I mean, kind of a silly question, but I was like, I'm curious. This is a cool atrium. And so I Google, it, it was a, a Sheridan Hotel in Orlando. When was it built? I spent a good hour. I'm like, there's gotta be a way to Google this that will get me to property records. There's gotta be like, right. and there is nothing you can type with Orlando and hotel <laughs> into any search engine anywhere that will get you anything other than infinite pages of hotel listings. Right. Um, and so like when it's like how to build an Olive Garden, like your first page is gonna be sponsored posts for Olive Garden. So, you, so what I'll end up, so with, the, so with how many McDonald's, so the person who asked about like the, the T-Rex, mm -hmm. um, how, many, how many people would it eat? How many hamburgers would you need to feed it to, to replace uh, uh, a person? You know, like if you, if you, assuming you've run, either you don't want to feed it to people or you've run out of people who you do want to feed to a T-Rex and you're like. And, and so then I was like, how many, how many hamburgers does McDonald's, you know, does a McDonald's store sell in a day? That's not an easily Googleable number. McDonald's doesn't like publish that. You know how they used to have the thing that was like. 35 X, billion yeah, sold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They stopped updating that number, I think, you know, quite a while ago. Because you could extrapolate before that, and you could figure out, hey, they're publishing the number of burgers they've sold, and you can divide by the number of stores they have and figure out how many burgers they sell per, per place. Um, and Nobody was doing that. <laughs> no, maybe not at the time, but I did that while writing that answer. Um, <laughs> and I had to extrapolate forward into the future because they stopped updating the sign. Uh -huh. So I did get McDonald's quarterly reports and look at like how many stores, they do say how many stores they've opened and I could take the ratio from the 90s when they had the signs. Um, and the thing is also, it's, it is also amazing the lengths I will go to to avoid making a phone call because <laughs> some of these questions could be answered <laughs> a lot more easily if I was willing to Google the nearest McDonald's and just be like, how many burgers do you make in a day? And then if that person's like, I don't think I'm supposed to answer that, I can, there's another McDonald's. I can just keep calling, you know. Um, and there, there are a lot of Do you ever go questions. to McDonald's just for the food or do you always got a weird question? No, I Let's mean- Let's just I, say I have a T-Rex. I'm uh, not saying I have a T-Rex. No, honestly, it's not, it's not even reluctance to, to to make a phone call, it's, I really don't want to bother people. Um, right. I mean, like, I honestly, That's I honestly That's where you and don't... I differ, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> you should if... ask me. I will go out and ask your questions, because I love to bother people. <laughs> so I'm ha you could send me a list of questions, and I'm happily, I will walk around and ask the questions. So there's a lot of questions that, so there's questions where I don't want to bother scientists because I, like, it was especially when I was writing, um, you know, during uh, working on some of these, you know, during during the early days of the pandemic, when every scientist who worked on anything related to disease or anything is getting bombarded by questions, and I couldn't tell whether I wanted to be like, I have a question for you. It's less important than what's going on, <laughs> like, or I could be like, I haven't, I have a science question that does not have to do with the pandemic. Would that be a welcome break? 
and, and generally people seem to be like, yes, that it would be nice to answer a question where the stakes are not if I answer this wrong, like thousands of people die. You know, right. they're like, it would be cool. I'm happy to talk about your, you know, blowing up the sun question. Um, <laughs> So, but like, I, that's something that I'm really, I've found that in general, when I reach out to scientists, they're really, they're, they're excited to talk about their work, especially if I'm like, I seriously, like, you wrote a good paper on this, I want to know how to apply it to this, like, you wrote a paper about the gene's instability leading to gravitational collapse that ignites the sun, which is the answer to your daughter's question. Um, <laughs> now, she'll, like, now she'll sleep like an angel. And, um, and, and I'm like, I tried applying your equations to soup, and, and I just want to know, am I doing this part right? You know, like, in general, like, once they know that you're, you're really, you read their paper, you're interested, they love talking about this stuff because they are interested in science and how it works, and, like, it's, it's really fun. And, like, I've, I generally don't regret bothering them. You know, it's not, like, but I'm reluctant to do it because I imagine them being, like, why are you talking to me about soup? I you know, right. I'm like uh, the foremost cosmology expert who has studied this subject, you know, like, and, and they're not like that, but I, I'm, I'm still like shy about bothering Have them. you so instead, ever had somebody yeah. hang up on you when you said, would all the earth's bananas fit in all the earth's churches? Do, do, <laughs> does anyone ever just hang up? No, um, no, they're, they're pretty, occasionally they're like, you know, that's, I, I think that's not my area, you know. And I'm like, I, I'm like, I've searched. It's nobody's area. You're the closest. <laughs> no, my favorite, my favorite was um, asking. Uh, uh, I so for my last book when I interviewed Colonel uh, Chris Hadfield mm -hmm. and got to ask him. I, I, my plan then I was asking him about uh, landing, um, landing a plane because I had a chapter on how to land a plane under strange circumstances and, and I got to interview him for that and ask him, so my plan was to ask him ridiculous situations, starting with like normal emergency landing situations. Um, so he's a test pilot, commander mm -hmm. of the International Space Station and he's flown like under different aircraft. Um, and so I was gonna start with simple landing questions and then make them weirder and weirder and weirder until he hung up on me. And, <laughs> and I spent a while preparing these scenarios and what I learned is um, that test pilots are uh, not ruffled by having weird situations thrown at them. <laughs> They're like, they are, they are fairly calm and in fact respond very directly and quickly with what they would do. Um, so, and that was, but it turned so out nothing he, was too ludicrous for him no. because he's a test pilot. Yeah. He's there. He can withstand like, like nine G's and eject yeah. if things get trouble. Yeah, he's yeah. like, well, when I was in a plane that tumbled end over end, I found it was really hard to reach your arm this way, so you have to do it this way. You know, that's why the button for this is over here. Next question, please. You know, um, <laughs> so this was really fun. And I asked him, like, what if you're trapped on the roof of the plane? And he's like, well, you can, uh, you know, you try to get back in this way. Uh, you, you can, you know, you could move your weight around and shift your weight if the plane is balanced. Um, you know, you can shift the center of gravity by crawling forward and backward. If you can get back to the tail, here's how. There's this, you can't move the aileron, but you know, you can change the flap. Uh, there's this little uh, control surface that's used to move the, and he started explaining how, you, you know, which part you could move by hand and which part you couldn't. Right. So test pilots are great. So <laughs> when I was writing this book, um, <clears throat> so, I, so what the, the punchline was, he actually just was like, I ran out of questions. And then he was like, do you have any more questions? And I was like, no. And he's like, oh, okay, cool. And I was like, I, uh, give me, a, I'll email you some more. And he's like, great. You know. <laughs> So, as a result of that interview, I had his phone number. So I was writing this book, and I, I like with What If One, I have an illustration on the cover that's not from any specific question. It's just a, a fun scenario. It was a T-Rex on top of an airliner as it's taking off. And, I, um, and so I was drawing this, as I was drawing the cover for the book, I was thinking, so, could, an airline, could a T-Rex stand on top of a plane and not collapse the roof, you know? Like, is this plausible what I'm drawing in that sense? Like, got to go for realism here. <laughs> and, and so, and, and it turns out that is actually answerable with a bunch of research. Um, because, because they, and the answer is yes. Um, the, the ribs of, airplanes are really strong. This is, this is honestly reassuring to me. Like, um, 
you know, like, like, cause you, you go, I know a lot about how airplanes work, but it's still weird that we fly around in the sky, you know? <laughs> um, but like learning more about like how, how strong those airframes are and like how like strong the force of the air holding the plane up is that thinking of it more like it's gliding on a fluid, you know, I find that stuff reassuring. Like, it's like, oh, okay, this thing is not gonna fall apart. Like, I am much more fragile than the plane I'm in. Um, and and the, the, the roof, the ribs on the roof, they can support the weight of all of those bags getting, if the plane gets slammed down in an emergency landing. And so they can support, uh, it turns out, the weight of a T-Rex. It could step through the aluminum, potentially, and get a claw hanging down into, you know, the cabin. Does the T-Rex have its own luggage? <laughs> I wonder, yeah, the... Probably, probably just a, like a carry-on. Well, I mean, I'm, the, the problems that it has at the TSA thing is it, <laughs> getting into the scanner is going to be your problem. I well, just picture a T-Rex taking its sneakers off and its belt <laughs> and being just as annoyed as the rest of us. Yeah, so, but then I'm like, now, how this plane... So, so that answers the question, could the T-Rex stand on there? But could it take off? And so I just take a picture of my drawing and text it without explanation to, to, to Colonel Hadfield. And just, because, you know, I love astronauts, test pilots. Like, the thing I learned from talking to them is that they're very, like, there's not a lot of, like, chit-chat. They're very, like, ask a question, get an answer. Like, you, when you're talking yeah, to ground yeah. control, you don't do pleasantries, you know. Right. But so I'm like, all right, I think this is okay. I think I'm not, I'm going to just text him this picture. And, and then I was just like, how do you think this plane would handle? <laughs> and he immediately texts back, um, you know, uh, 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 fine if the T-Rex doesn't wander too far back or forward. Um, <laughs> because, and, then, and then he texted a picture. He said, you, you, you got to make sure you got hard points under where it's putting its feet, uh, you know, to, to, to right. keep it from stepping through into the cabin. But, and then he texted a picture of the shuttle carrier aircraft, which was the 747 modified to carry the space shuttle. They just bolted it on top, yeah. um, and it, it flies okay. You, you know, they have to adjust the flap settings and like the, make sure it's centered, but you know. Um, my, actually, my, fin my single favorite joke in all of maybe engineering is the shuttle carrier aircraft has this big mount at the top where they, the shuttle like fastens onto it. It's like a ball and socket thing, mm -hmm. and, and on it, and on the mount on top of the, the aircraft, there's a plaque that says, attach orbiter here. <laughs> And then under it in smaller letters, black side down. <laughs> um, so I send him one more question. This is also, this is all like, this is exclusive content. Because um, this is just while I was like finishing up the cover and I'm like, I'm curious about this in case someone asks. So I asked him, um, okay, so plane would handle okay if the T-Rex doesn't move, you know, stays centered and manages to keep a grip on it. Um, and then I was like, so in this situation, what would you do? <laughs> and, and again, this is, he's, the astronauts are, are great, um, and test pilots are great. So I send that question, in this situation, what would you do? And immediately, he's like, you know, typing, he's typing. And I get, and then he just says, pitch forward, get ne try to get negative Gs. So, <laughs> which will, meaning, fling it off of the roof yeah. by, by going, <laughs> You know, like if you go into enough of a dive, you get weightless, and then if you go into more of a dive, you get flung outward. And then he was like, uh, pitch, pitch over, get negative Gs. If it's hanging on, dive to gain airspeed, get more wind, and then you could try rolling back and forth and seeing if you can shake it off that way. Um, I, and I also, I picture him, as he's answering these questions, he's in a plane that's crashing while he's answering it. <laughs> The first time I interviewed him, he, he only had an hour to talk to me because he was boarding a flight. And when he answered, he was like, yeah, no, I'm at a, I'm at a layover. I'm in a quiet part of the terminal. And, and so he was answering all these questions. And I was just imagining other passengers, some of whom might be nervous about flying, <laughs> listening to his end of the conversation. And then at one point, I'm like, OK, I'm watching the clock. I know you got to go. And he's like, no, 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 it's OK. They haven't called my group number. Keep, keep going. These are great questions. And then. <laughs> And then at the moment, he's like, hang on, they got to scan my boarding pass, but I'll answer that one. <laughs> uh, and then eventually, so the, in the end of that, I hung up on him. Uh, because I was like, I can't put other passengers through that. <laughs> uh, no, but he, he, he explained his procedure, and I was like, you, okay, but um, this is a dinosaur on the roof of your plane. Supposing, like, 
this is the first, and you've seen dinosaurs being alive. Maybe this is the first any of us have learned that there is a living dinosaur. This could be the only one. This is a huge mystery. Like, these things were extinct for 65 million years. What's it doing here? Um, it would be invaluable to paleontology. Um, what do you do? How do you balance that? And immediate reply, not my concern. Yeah. <laughs> Which... <laughs> I'm with him. Especially if I'm on the plane. That... I didn't ask the dinosaur to get on the plane. That is what you want in a pilot. Yeah. All right, let me make sure I do this because uh, it's important that we get to, we've been talking uh, for, for over an hour. I want to make sure that we open this up to questions in the audience because I'm sure you have some. Yeah. Can you give more examples of things you can't Google? <laughs> Um, I literally do have this on my phone. Um, let's see, there was Greek words for learn. For a while, there was the question, like, I know that oysters open and close their shells, uh, you know, in response to water conditions, because they, they do whatever it is oysters do all day. Uh, I've, I've never really asked. Um, but, you know, it, some, it involves, you know, taking in water and stuff, and they say they open and close their shells. But what I couldn't figure out was, I know they do it in response to conditions, but is it like a, they can, snap it shut thing or is it like a slow like over like a starfish or something moving where you're like oh if you watch it you see it moving like what time scale are we talking about here turns out though there are a lot of people who are super into uh food and preparing oysters and also preparing oysters efficiently and like the speed at which you can open an oyster shell turns out to be a key component of preparing oysters and so all you get is discussions of people with strong opinions about Maybe it's just people who are really into oysters have strong opinions, but right. they, it's nothing but uh, tips on quickly opening oyster shells. And I'm like, I want to know if I leave it up to the oyster. <laughs> <laughs> I know how fast I can open an oyster I guess shell. Google's not always the answer. Yeah, Sometimes yeah, you got to do some, uh, some footwork. Next question. I give you a battery with all the power of the sun in one, for one second. Please do not give me that. <laughs> What's the most wonderful thing you can do with that? What I like about the sun, other than like the obvious, you know, <laughs> it is where basically everything that happens here comes from. Um, it, it is the, the source of all life and the reason we can see and that, you know, uh, all that stuff. But also, it does make calculations easy because like all of the numbers involved with the sun it's like 10 to the, and it's a large number in the exponent. And that means that like, like the, the, the answer to all of the questions, like I don't even have to do the basic math of like on a log scale multiplying exponents together. If you're like, this battery has all the power of the sun, can you? And it's like, yes, the answer is gonna be yes. <laughs> you know. But would it cause a, yes, you know, like, <laughs> unless the question involves another sun or a bunch of soup, um, you know, and, and so like, like a battery with, with all of the power of the sun would, uh, uh, that's enough power, that's already, it doesn't matter if it's just all of the power of the sun outputs in one second, it's still, that's more power than anything humans are doing with anything, you know, I don't even need to like check a number, like, um, and I like this especially, supernovas are really cool because the numbers are bigger by another whole bunch of orders of magnitude um, than sun numbers. My, maybe my favorite comparison I've ever come up with was, I was trying to talk about how bright supernovas are um, in my previous book, and, if, and so I was trying to compare a supernova, if the sun had, were, became a supernova, which it can't do because it's not big enough, but if it did and we were at the distance away from uh, the, uh, this distance away from it, you know, 90, 93 million miles, how bright would it be? And so I calculated this brightness, but it's one of those giant numbers, and so I didn't know how to compare it. And I said, okay, if you had the supernova 93 million miles away, and you took a hydrogen bomb, and you pressed it against your eye, <laughs> and you detonated it, the supernova would be brighter <laughs> By nine orders of magnitude. <laughs> um, so I really like sun questions just because you're like, whatever, whatever number you're dealing with, like, you just know that's, it's big enough. Right. 
If you took out the gene that makes like your cells age, could you theoretically make someone or something immortal? And how would you kill that? <laughs> as, as I understand it, um, I mean, uh, as I understand it, especially in this state, there are a bunch of people, um, <laughs> many of whom started off in the tech world and then moved into the world of uh, drinking millennial blood, figuring out how to make their cells live forever. Um, it's definitely a thing that, that uh, you know, uh, 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 an obsession that consumes people. Um, also, uh, uh, the, the, the cause of the downfall of Numenor. Um, spoilers for the show that's coming up. Uh, but it's, it's been out in book for a long time. Um, but uh, uh, the, the, the question of like why we get old and die is super complicated and partly involves like uh, uh, it's actually bad if cells keep doing their thing forever um, because sometimes if they get nudged the wrong direction by gamma rays they grow out of control and so they have, there's a whole bunch of like mechanisms that are pushing and pulling um, to keep cells from aging uh, and to, but to also like make sure if they go too out of control and grow too many times like something cuts them off. And, and so there's research into like the, the DNA telomerase and like the, the cellular clock mechanisms and how to like stop those you know from from running so your cells keep growing and then we'll have a long so uh, and then and then we get to solve all the problems of like oh no the cells have kept growing and it turns out that's not always good um, but there was a really interesting paper just now one of my favorite there's a study from about 2000 2007 2008 about um, uh, memory B cells. Immune system is a hot topic right now for recent, some reason. Um, and, and there's a study though where they took uh, uh, the 1918 flu pandemic uh, virus, they took that influenza and they made uh, the proteins from that influenza and they got blood samples from, from people and they tried exposing the blood to the, the proteins. And when they exposed the blood of uh, people in their 80s, uh, it, you know, didn't, it didn't really react. And then they exposed the blood of people in their 90s and the B cells start pumping out antibodies. And it's because the people who were in their 90s in 2008 were kids when the 1918 flu pandemic happened and were exposed to the virus. And 90 years later, their memory B cells are like, I recognize that guy <laughs> and, and react. And so there's um, uh, uh, just like today, or I saw this paper pop up that was, because the question is, so our, our, our immune systems, they remember that stuff. They remember stuff that happened to us when we were infants into the paper, as the paper puts it, like into like the, the 10th decade of life. <laughs> um, so that is so cool. That's one of my favorite like just scientific studies because it's just, it, I think it's really cool. But also the question is like, how do those B cells stick around? And there's a paper just this like week on why B cells, on how they like absorb telomerase from cells that they are breaking down. Um, that was the, the, the abstract. I haven't gotten to read the paper yet, but it, they're like figuring out how it is that B cells stick around that long um, and, and manage to rejuvenate themselves. Um, but it turns out our cells can do that when they need to, and it it's, helps us keep watch against viruses that we have seen before, which and is just cool. To, uh, I'm glad we can do that. Yeah, and just there was the last part of your question was, and how would we kill it? I'm pretty sure this 130-year-old person, I think I could still hit him with a car. <laughs> yeah. I don't um, think that's a big problem. Actually, think... you can really just flip to any other chapter in my book. Yeah. <laughs> Go, hey, you, hey, 150-year-old guy, and you're running you know shorts. Really you should cool check out Yellowstone. Yellowstone. <laughs> <laughs> just or order the soup. <laughs> Other than what's outside of the universe, what topics do we know so little, so little about in science that you're not able to get any traction and do any research on them? Um, well, there's all these, like, whenever anyone's like, what are the unknown things? People are like, Higgs, Higgs boson, the, the nature of the end of the, how the Big Bang began, the, where the universe, you know, how did life get started? Um, and those are cool, cool questions. And I am also, if anyone knows the answer, you know, let me actually, that's the kind of thing that you do get emails by people who are like, I have a whole theory. Here, read my manifesto. And you're like, <laughs> so actually, but um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm super interested in those questions, but I, I really like the questions that are like very straightforward and simple that we don't know the answer to. Um, like, 
you know when you rub a balloon on your hair and your hair sticks up? Um, we don't know why that happens. <laughs> I thought we did know why that happens. I did too. Um, so I had heard when you rub, so, so, so first of all, you know, I had heard um, that you, you, know, you rub the balloon on your hair and um, there, there are electrons, the electrons in the atoms in your hair move to the rubber of the balloon, which causes your hair to be, uh, uh, it loses electrons so it becomes positively charged and, and the balloon becomes negatively charged. The hair, hairs are positively charged, they repel each other and they try to stick out. That makes sense. But so why do the electrons go from the hair to the balloon? And the answer is something called the triboelectric series, which says that like hair, um, it's like a list of materials and which one's electrons go from one to the other on. And, and hair is on one side and balloon rubber is on the other. And the reason that they are in that order is that if you try rubbing a balloon on your hair, that's the way the electrons go. <laughs> but we don't know why they go in that direction with those particular materials. There are papers explaining, um, you know, for one particular combination of materials, they're like, we think we have an abstraction that explains this molecule has the electrons facing this way and they do this. But then like, that theory does not apply to any other materials, and if you try to, you get the wrong answers. Um, and this turns out to matter not just for balloons, but like um, when thunderstorms, you know, when you're like, why are there bolts of lightning coming down from the sky sometimes and occasionally like uh, uh, killing people? This seems important and bad, you know? Like, you can see why someone would be like, I, I think there's a person up there who's mad at me. <laughs> um, <laughs> But then we get, we get you know, the tools of science and we get to investigate lightning. We're like, oh, it's a big electrical spark. And you're like, oh, why are the clouds charged? You know, like there's an electrical charge between the cloud and the ground and then it's equalized by an electrical spark. And you know, uh, 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 you know someone flew a kite and they were like, oh yeah, that's definitely, I got an electric shock, that's no good. Um, but why, why, is the, why are the clouds charged? And the answer is there's, uh, there are updrafts in the clouds and there are little ice crystals going up and then there are heavier, like these ice pellets, this graupel sort of mix, falling down with their like water droplets, water ice droplets, and they hit the ice crystals going up, and electrons are transferred from one to the other, and you end up with the negative, the electrons down at the bottom and the negative charge at the bottom, and, 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 um, and we don't know why the, the charge jumps from one to the other in that direction, we just know it seems to happen because lightning happens, but we don't know why. Um, and, and that is not even, and so there's a, there's a review paper from 2022 that's like, it's interesting that we have been aware of, of static charging for millennia, and yet we still do not understand the basic mechanics of how it happens. Um, and this, this comes up in a, in a whole bunch of places. And then also other unanswered questions about lightning include, uh, why, does, why do lightning bolts get started? Um, because the, the electrical fields that we've measured in the clouds aren't strong enough to to cause dielectric breakdown of air. So something else is going on in there. Really hard to go in there and do studies. Um, and so, uh, unless you have a pilot who's willing to, to fly, actually- We know the guy. Yeah. Um, we learned in the 90s that uh, uh, thunderstorms emit flashes of gamma rays. Don't know why. There's nothing physically impossible, like things produce gamma rays, but it, this is a weird result. I was trying to explain to someone why that was weird. And um, I was like, it's like if you noticed that now and then cats emit flashes of light. <laughs> and that's like, it's not, impossi it's not impossible for animals to emit light. Fireflies do it, like, you know. And cats, we, there's lots we don't understand about cats. You know, they're very mysterious. Still a surprise. <laughs> um, yeah, so thunderstorms emit gamma rays. Maybe it has something to do with how the lightning gets started. Uh, this is active research. Also the balloon hair thing, active area of research. Um, when you peel up a scotch tape and it emits x-rays. That, like, that's a thing that happens. <laughs> Does not, it? Not a Does lot. it happen? I didn't yeah, know that. You get, if you, someone told me this once, if you crush a sugar, a, a sugar cube in the dark with pliers, it emits flashes of light. And I was like, that's not true. I'm an adult. I would know that by now. <laughs> Turns out uh, that was true. Um, I, Cause I immediately went and got like sugar and I, luckily I had a thing of sugar that I hadn't used and it was like all crystal, single crystal. I got pliers, I went into the dark. You have to let your eyes adjust cause it's kind of faint. Crushed it and I was like, oh my God, there are flashes of light. Um, and the, the reason is uh, that the, 
the, um, the sugar crystals fracture, and then as they pull apart, electrons jump from one to the other. <laughs> and, and in doing so, there's, there's, um, uh, we, we understand how electrons release, um, you know, lead to radiation release, because a moving electron in a field will, will, will spontaneously emit radiation. That's a common process. We understand that. Why the electrons jump from one part of the crystal to the other as you pull it apart like that? Active area of research. <laughs> Why can't we just let it be? <laughs> These electrons jump. Leave I mean, it alone. What, it's, it's killing you, man. That's what we've been doing for three, you know, the, Let's for, keep that ball millennia. rolling. Let's yeah. not ask. We will. That's going to keep happening by default <laughs> until someone figures it out. When deciding what to post, uh, what, how do you self-edit? What makes a strip and what doesn't? Um, well, like, when I'm, when I'm coming up with these answers, like, when I'm writing about stuff, I'm... I'm not thinking, so one thing that I try not to do is like, I have no idea who's gonna be reading this. And like, I have to think both, like, I learned very quickly that like, if I write about a specific field, the people who are like experts in that field may very well come across my work or have it emailed to them like constantly for the rest of their lives, in which case I apologize. Um, and so I have to like write stuff for, you know, I, I'm like, I wanna make sure I get this all correct because this is gonna get looked at by, you know, doctor, you know, who, person who wrote this paper that I'm citing throughout, you know. Um, and so I've gotta get those, the details right, but then I'm also like, I'm not trying to write this, I'm trying to write this in a way that is clear to people. And, and so I try not to think about like, you know, I'm gonna write this for someone who doesn't know something. I try to think, think about like myself when I first came across this subject and like what, what confused me about it and then, and then just be like, okay, I know that I took this long, complicated path to get to the answer, you know, to understand this thing. But what are the things that, um, like, a lot of that was blind alleys or like Googling things that you can't Google or reading McDonald's corporate reports and finding they do not publish the number I wanted to get from them. Um, so I'm gonna try to save myself time and make it just as, I will imagine that I'm like talking to someone who's not, not it's not someone who doesn't understand this stuff, but someone who is really busy, and they wanna get what they need to know sort of without all of the filler of like, this was time I wasted. And if there's enough of the cool stuff, you know, I'll write that up as an answer. Um, and, and similarly with comics, I've actually found it's, it's easiest to write about stuff when you're still a little bit confused by it, because the stuff that's weird and confusing about it still seems weird and confusing to you, but then like when you've been working in the field forever, you're like, oh yes, we all use this symbol that looks really weird and we've all just gotten used to it. But now that you point it out, it does kind of look like a Pokemon, you know? <laughs> um, and, and like a lot of that stuff is sometimes more obvious when you're first coming into the field. That's how I, uh, one of my first comics, uh, I did a comic about, um, so someone taught me about uh, SQL injections or or SQL injections, I think, depending on which denomination you're brought up in, um, the, the pronunciation. Um, and, and someone explained that like, it's this problem where if you have a string of code embedded in a string that you're trying to process, um, you, you can get the, com if the computer, you know, if the software is written badly, it will hit that, think it's the end of the string it's supposed to process, and think it's code it's supposed to execute. And so by submitting on a web form something that has this malicious code in it, you can take over a server that, that's got you know, flawed security. And I was like, wait, so this is just a general problem with like text coming in, right? Well, what do you do if the, the kid actually, you know, like if someone actually gives their kid a name that has one of these injections in it? <laughs> I mean, is that what we're talking about here? Would that work? And then like me asking that confused question, I was like, oh, okay, apparently that would work. And then I did a comic about someone who, who, who named her kid, you know, Robert, and then like a bunch of punctuation, and then like drop table students. And then, and then if he tries to enroll in school, the school database gets erased. And, um, and, then, and then to my surprise that, you know, like I, I met a lot of database engineers who were like, oh yeah, we just use that as, short, that as a shorthand to explain why this is a thing we need to fix. You know, this is this, this flaw. And, and it's fun that that, but that was literally that line of code was the first database query I ever wrote. <laughs> so the, the first database code I wrote was an injection, 
and then I actually learned to use databases for projects and stuff. And, and, but it's, it's when you don't understand something that the stuff that's weird about it is still obvious. And I think that's helpful in both explaining stuff and in, in figuring out what in the field is ridiculous and you, know, uh, you can kind of make fun of. Uh, yeah, so, so confusion is, is great and we should embrace it and like, it points us in interesting directions. Your recurring characters in your strip, Black Hat, Ponytail, are they archetypes? Are they people you know, or are they amalgamations of people you know? Um, I've always, I, 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 I feel like there are different genres of comic where you'll have comics with characters. And for me, I always grew up, um, I, I grew up reading Calvin and Hobbes um, was I think probably my favorite, you know, my biggest influence in comics. But you know, I read everything um, and The Far Side was a big influence, uh, especially because uh, um, there was a lot of science content in there, you know, and, and a, lot of bi a lot of biology content, especially. There's, there's not a lot of comics with um, uh, as much of that as The Far Side, so you still see that on, a, on professor's doors. And, and I liked The Far Side format of like, there are some sort of recurring characters, but they're not named, you know, they're sort of fresh in each situation. And if you wanna watch closely, you can see the, you know, some of those threads. But I like that kind of blank slate, like you aren't worrying about the backstory, you're just, we're gonna talk about this thing today. Um, and so that's sort of the, I try to take more of the far side approach. Do you have an example of an application or scenario where two very different fields combine and complement each other? Like marine biology and astrophysics, for example. Is there a scenario in which they can work together? Um, I really hope we can find some scenarios where marine biology and astrophysics work together. <laughs> I mean, so, so we are, there, there's the, the Jupiter icy moon's orbiter, there's the, the Europa, Europa lander plans. Definitely we had a synthesis of those things going there um, because there are oceans in the solar system that are not the ones here that we know about and we wanna see what's in them because, uh, uh, but that means we have to get things to go down there and look around and then and then, fingers crossed, uh, marine biologists maybe can help us with what we find there. Um, you know, what we remain to see, but also need the marine biologists to figure out how to get the ROV to not uh, fail when you put it in the water, um, which if anyone, random recommendation, uh, Okeanos is this, um, uh, the NOAA does, it's this ocean exploration and mapping thing with ROVs and they do live streams and you can just tune into the stream on the weeks when they're doing dives and just see live footage of the sea floor with an ROV exploring something that's like very likely never been looked at before with scientists commenting on what they're seeing slash being really confused by what they're seeing. <laughs> um, and it's just a YouTube stream. I don't understand how it's not like the most watched thing on the internet. I find it, I, I love uh, watching it. And that's uh, uh, Okeanos Ocean Explorer. But, but I, love, I love exploring unknown stuff in the real world because it gets you those, um, those weird juxtapositions. One of my favorite things that I saw while watching Okeanos, um, it was sort of disappointing. They were like, we've got what we think you know, is an interesting signature on radar. Could be a reef structure, could be you know, a shipwreck. We're, we're looking, you know, this is like, and this was like in the Atlantic where there had been a bunch of shipwrecks. You know, it's, you're always like, well, maybe it's a cool treasure ship. Maybe it's an important historical thing. And they got the radar signal, but they, and they had all the marine biologists because they're like trying to figure out, they were looking for whale falls too and for um, black smokers, the, the hydrothermal vents. And so they have all the people on tap. You know, there's the, the marine biology people, there's like the, the fish and shark and ray people, the sponge people, like there's all, they're all waiting to see. It's like, is it gonna be something in my area of expertise or my area of expertise? Um, and they'll even have a historian who can do the shipwreck. So they, uh, they approach this thing, and it's like an hour of approaching it across the bottom, seeing various things, and it comes into view and you see these white shapes, and, and they're kind of cube-shaped, and you get closer, and they're white cubes about yay big, and then you get closer and you realize they are washing machines. <laughs> And then they found there was a ruptured container from a container ship that went over the side in a storm and fell and scattered washing, like it was like washer, dry, washers and dryers, like <laughs> across the bottom of the sea. 
and the ROV approaches it, and there, you can hear all of the different area experts just being like, huh. <laughs> well, it's, it's dryers. Uh, I guess, I think they're dryers. Yeah. And then, but then my favorite moment on, was, uh, then the ROV pilot pipes up and is like, my mom owns a laundromat. <laughs> and those are actually Maytag model so-and-sos from year so-and-so. <laughs> And I, and I just, I just love, I, I love seeing people like figure things out and know about stuff and bring knowledge from weird places and apply it to things that you would not expect that kind of expertise to be applied to. And, and it's, it's cool. People know, so many people, diff people, different people know really different things and it's really fun to like write about this stuff, share like here's all the weird stuff people are learning about and then people learn about this stuff, you know, people, learn about their own stuff, send in their questions, I get to research them, um, and it's really cool. So thank it's, you everyone. Yeah, thank you all very much. Let's hear it for Randall Monroe! Thank you.